Great to be back. Thank you very much. Talking once again on mobile security, taking two very different angles, though, from what we talked about the last couple of years. Um, this time we want to dive uh, into the same topic that Tobias Engel just did, um, looking at insecurities that arise from the internet, interconnect networks between different operators. And we want to add another angle, and that is how you can start self-defending yourself from the insecurities that many of your operators have left open for many years, including the new ones that Tobias and myself talk about. Um, if you do watch this on a download, do go back and also watch Tobias's talk. It's well worth it and also covers a lot of the basics that I'm just going to skip over now um, for the sake of time. Um, great talk, by the way. Thank you, Tobias. Um, so aside from... <laughs> Aside from those SS7-based attacks, um, we want to talk about 3G insecurities, um, not too many of them, but severe as ever, um, as well as in the last chapter then, um, a few uh, tips as well as a new tool to help you start self-defending against these mobile attacks. Now, just briefly then, uh, what is the SS7 network? Um, Tobias already covered the basics, so um, just a quick definition for me. It's this network that different mobile operators are connected to to exchange data amongst each other. For instance, text messages are sent over this network. Um, so without SS7, you couldn't be using this ancient chatting technology, SMS. Thank you, SS7. But also more security-relevant um, information is exchanged over SS7. For instance, if you're using your phone in another country, as many of you currently do, um, you still want this visiting network to be able to use encryption with your phone. But how is that network going to know the right encryption key? So this visiting network, the German network, has to ask your home network for the correct encryption key, and that goes over SS7. And you can already see if there's cryptographic information being exchanged, if the wrong people ask and still receive an answer, insecurities arise. More interesting from a security perspective, though, are messages that are exchanged within one network over SS7. So SS7 is often misunderstood as this technology that's used for worldwide exchange of information. The same network, though, is used inside an operator. So with no need for interconnect, there's already um, SS7 flows going on between those different mobile switching centers, MSC. And each mobile switching center covers one area, let's say a city. So imagine the situation where you are, uh, you're in a call um, and you're traversing from one area to another. You're crossing, let's say, a state boundary. So this new MSC doesn't know how to handle your call. It needs the decryption key for the already ongoing conversation. So there's a, another SS7 message that allows you to query for the, the key of a transaction that's currently going on. Okay? And again, you can already see how if the wrong people send this type of uh, message and they receive an answer, insecurities arise. Um, the insecurity that, that has most been talked about in recent years, I guess up until Tobias's talk, um, was tracking. And tracking was often understood as there's this evil message, the anytime interrogation, and the Washington Post focused a lot in the article on this one message. And it's, a, it's really evil, it should not been, have been ever standardized, uh, and whenever it's used, it's for for evil purposes. There's no usefulness in this message. Um, and then Tobias quoted a number that I, I think the Washington Post found in a lot of marketing material. 70% of mobile networks respond to this message. Now, this is information from earlier this year. A lot of networks, very good news, have moved to, to uh, stop responding to the anytime interrogation message. This evil spying message is not being responded to by, um, for instance, all German networks. You can't use this message in Germany anymore. Um, however, um, this is a very retroactive approach to, to, to securing SS7 because there's um, a number of other messages that consider them gadgets get you to the same place, taking a phone number and take you all the way to somebody's uh, location. And uh, here's just a snapshot of, of which messages you can use. And Tobias uh, went into a greater level of detail in um, 
how these different messages come together. So if anybody thinks that by just barring any time integration you solve the, the tracking problem, um, they are wrong. But at the same time, it's not that SS7 is not securable. It's just a much larger challenge that people uh, consider it currently to be. Um, so um, you see how, how stringing together some of these messages uh, get you to intermediate values that also shouldn't be public, and then all the way to, to a salary. And up until all these messages, or at least every pass that takes you from left to right, is blocked by network, uh, tracking uh, to the same accuracy the cell ID says possible. Now, this is just one of many areas in which SS7 can become an issue. Um, here's four more. Um, it's an intercept risk. If people can uh, read your uh, SMS text or listen to your calls, it's a denial of service risk. If people cut you off from, from phone connectivity for anywhere from an hour until the next location update um, to, or till you next reboot your phone. So you can really cut people off badly from, from the phone network. Um, there's the area of fraud that I don't think many people want to talk about publicly, certainly I don't, but there's many fraud risks in, in SS7 in which you can either put charges on somebody else's bill, or more interestingly, you can remove limits on your own prepaid cards, basically run up infinite charges on prepaid cards, and uh, you know, running up a lot of bills to, prepaid, uh, to, to premium numbers, for instance. And then there's the risk of spamming, uh, which from what I hear is already happening, um, SS7-based spam attacks. Now, for the sake of this talk, I want to focus on intercept, um, which I consider, aside from tracking, the most intrusive and the most relevant for us. These other risks are more relevant for the network operators. And if they don't solve them, well, so be it, as long as they foot the bill for it. Right? So intercept. And I want to go into three possible scenarios in which SS7-assisted intercept can happen. The first abuses the exact messages we looked at in the introduction, these messages where different parts of networks ask each other for, for encryption information. And it's a pretty straightforward attack. You record the airwaves around somebody's, in, in somebody's vicinity, <clears throat> and you record somebody's encrypted transaction as part of that. Right? So, and 3G and transaction, for instance, are pretty well secured, but they're not very hard to record. In fact, 3G um, is a little bit easier than 2G because it doesn't jump around all these frequencies. So you record, let's say, 3G data, and uh, you have a bunch of transactions in there, all of them encrypted. And you can use this message over SS7 to decrypt them. It's called send identification. And as I, as I said on one of the earlier slides, it's supposed to be used when you're um, moving from one MSC into another MSC, but still within your own network, so that the call doesn't get disrupted. It's not supposed to be used um, when, when somebody foreign uh, wants to query your phone. If, if they need a new encryption key, the, a new call needs to start anyway. There's no way to hand over a call from one operator to another operator without disruption. So this message is used only for internal purposes. However, out of the four German operators earlier this month, all four responded to this request coming from another country. Another country that doesn't even border Germany. So there's, there's no way to even conceptually think a call would be handed over. Okay? So four out of four. And that's not an anomaly. Um, most networks we query at international respond to an, to an outside number when asked for the current decryption key. Um, I'll show you a quick demo on this at the end of this chapter, but I will first finish the enumeration of all the different possibilities in which 3G calls can be intercepted. The second one are uh, the good old IMSI catchers, which we all thought wouldn't work on 3G. And I guess for the most part, they, they don't, unless SS7 comes to, to the help. So why, why don't they work without SS7? An IMSI catcher pretends to be a base station, and if it's 2G technology, the phone has no way of knowing the difference between the real base station um, and this fake base station. Right? But then 3G, the 3G standard, introduced what they call mutual authentication. So this time the base station has to prove to a phone that in fact it's legitimate, and unless it does that, um, the phone won't connect. 
Now, this only solves part of the IMSI catch-up problem, um, just taken by the name. IMSI catching is still possible. IMSI catching in the sense of um, creating a list of all the IMSIs in a location, right? Um, because there's a certain chicken and egg problem. If, if, if you want me as the base station to authenticate to you, you first have to tell me who you are. There's no such thing as SSL or any type of public key in the mobile network. It's all symmetric key. So you first have to tell me which key to use. And by that, I know who you are. So IMSI catching is always possible. And that's why if you Google for 3G IMSI catcher, those things exist. But they aren't capable of recording phone calls or SMS because those then require the mutual authentication. They aren't capable of doing so unless they ask over SS7 for an authentication key. So IMSI catchers are back in the 3G world big time unless we solve these SS7 problems. Right? Um, th the third possibility of, um, of intercept, this is probably the scariest uh, because it can happen completely remotely. Both the ones I enumerated so far, you have to be somewhere in the vicinity, in the radio vicinity of someone. So the third possibility I want to call the rerouting attacks. And they work in both directions. Rerouting is the idea, and Tobias touched on this, um, of taking of taking somebody's phone calls and uh, changing the destination number so that, in fact, you call somebody else, uh, unbeknownst to you, of course, as the victim. Um, and uh, this works both for incoming calls and outgoing calls, but using very different methods, so it just kind of accidentally works in both directions. Um, and this part, uh, I just briefly want to demonstrate. Um, Tobias and I coordinated on, on most of this, but this part, I guess we kind of misunderstood each other, so we'll, we'll both show this. Uh, I'll, I'll keep this very brief. And the point I want to get across is uh, that one, a single SS7 message is already a big intercept problem. Let's see, connected here. Um, so I'll try not to make the same mistake as Tobias and try to cut off part of my number here. <laughs> So, 31C3 demo phone. So I'm calling a, a phone that, in fact, accidentally we left in. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> so I'm calling this number, and I don't know if you can hear this, but it's, it's ringing. And we did leave this phone back in Berlin accidentally, but for the sake of this demo, that makes no, no difference. So it's a, it's a phone somewhere in Berlin that nobody answers to, right? Here's another phone. So if I, if I register what I call a supplementary service to this number, and that's just fancy language for, for, for call forwarding, um, if I call this exact same number again, and this phone is ringing, right? Um, Now, of course, to, to make this real intercept, um, I wouldn't forward it to a phone. I would forward it to a computer that then is smart enough to very quickly erase the call forwarding and call the original number and then connect it to, so that the phone, the phone call actually goes to where it was supposed to go. Just I'm sitting in the middle and I'm receiving a copy of it. Okay. Um, so that's the idea in this direction. In the other direction, the exact same thing works as well, and Tobias already told you how. Um, these services that say, um, let me rewrite your phone number for you, because you don't know how to dial a phone number when you're on vacation, right? Those services can be set by anybody, at least on a lot of networks. And you can see how the exact same thing works there, so that every time you dial a number that just move their own number in place of that number, and then connect those two calls, right? Um, so as I said, I, I consider those the, um, the scariest type of attacks because they, they work completely remotely. You don't have to be in the radio vicinity of anybody. And surprisingly, this still works against a bunch of networks, um, even against those networks that moved to solve some of the earlier issues. So networks still very retroactive. Um, so what do, what do those mobile networks now have to do to, to solve those issues? Um, well, as always, of course, the answer, it depends. It depends, in this case, on the attack type. Some of the attacks can simply be blocked, 
like the anytime interrogation that earlier this year they said 70% of the networks are vulnerable, now in Germany it's zero. So something happened there. Um, and the same is true for the, uh, for the first type of attack that I've shown, the, the passive intercept. I said when we tested earlier this month, four out of four networks were vulnerable, now it's down to two. So within two weeks, two networks put in a firewall rule that says this message has no purpose traversing our outside network boundary. Just block it there. It's a typical firewall, right? The same isn't possible for these other two types of attacks um, because those messages are actually useful. They do something, at least in certain circumstances. Um, if you block the second type of uh, query here, the send authentication info, um, you couldn't be roaming in another country anymore, right? If you block the third one, you couldn't be changing your, your voicemail forwarding from another country anymore. So these are uh, needed. Uh, still, we, couldn't, we can't accept that just anybody who asks over SS7, oh God, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Let's switch this off. <laughs> um, we can't accept that just anybody who asks over SS7 receives an answer. At the very least, we'd expect networks to only answer to their friends on SS7, and that is their roaming partners. That's already a lot fewer companies, and especially a lot fewer sketchy companies than everybody else on SS7. We would then uh, want those networks to do some plausibility checking. Right? So this, this phone in Berlin that I just put a, um, a supplementary service on, uh, the network operator knows the phone is in Berlin. And I sent this query from the other end of the world. Still, they honored it. Right? Any type of plausibility checking would, would uh, clearly see that this is not possible for a phone to be in one country and for this user to want to change their voicemail setting from somewhere completely different. Right? And then thirdly, networks need to limit the rate at which this happens. Those services that the Washington Post talked about, these tracking services, um, these are large operations. They seem to be tracking thousands of people constantly. Right? This will show in logs. Right? You don't allow some random network somewhere else in the world to constantly interrogate hundreds of your users. Right? It's clearly abuse. Has any network moved to put such sensible rules in? I'm not aware of it, but it's certainly the next step. And I'm not ready to give up on SS7 yet. I've heard one too many times that SS7 is an old technology built with no security in mind, and we just can't fix it. The internet also is an old technology built with no security in mind, and we did fix it since the 90s. Since when you connected the Windows 95 computer to the internet, it got infected with the virus right away. We have moved to put in firewalls. We're not exposing our printer daemon and our file sharing daemon on the entire internet anymore for 4 billion people to connect to. And the same is possible on SS7. Just we're still in the 90s. Thank you. <clears throat> Having said that, though, let me show you what, what happens if, you, if we don't do that, the fun part. Um, so, um, we, we, we argued whether or not we wanted to show this as a live demo. You'll understand why we don't show it as a live demo. There's just too much stuff that could go wrong. Um, but here's the setup. We start with just a phone number, and we want to string together a couple of SS7 gadgets, um, while also having this radio handy that can capture 3G information to capture yet more information that's not available over SS7, right? So we start with a phone number, and we send what's called an SRI for SM message which gives us, if the network is configured to answer, um, the MC and the MSC that the um, subscriber currently is connected for. Those two are used as parameters into another call called uh, the PSI message, provide subscriber info. Um, and that call then gives us the cell ID. So this is how you get more and more information with different um, gadgets. Now the cell ID tells us where somebody is physically. So Imagine we now move our radio to that location, and we again send a PSI. We record the PSI with that radio, uh, not the PSI, the, what happens over the airways when we send the PSI. And the, the phone gets paged, 
So when we send that PSI over SS7, the phone receives some information, right? Um, this, this radio plus a little bit GNU radio scripting um, gives us that information. Who has been paged during that short window of time that we, um, that we recorded? Um, now, when we record something on UMTS, we always record for different cells. They share frequencies. But you see, the, the one cell where the cell ID came back over SS7 is included in our set. So we filter the data for that cell, and we look for which IMCs are included. And luckily for us, only one IMC got paged within those few seconds on that cell. Right? It's the same. same um, this is now the, the TIMZ that belongs to this phone. This is information we can't get over SS7. But what we can do over SS7 with the TIMZ is request a key. So it gets complicated. But, so we have the decryption key now. And the next time this phone receives something, unless they change the key, in which case we can ask again for a new key. Next time this phone receives something, and what you don't see in the video, somebody is now sending a text message to the phone, we can also record that. Right? Again, same radio, the one shown in the picture. Now the phone did receive the text message. And there's a few more steps. So the phone received the text message, and we also again recorded the, the airwaves. Um, we again run it through some GNU radio script. Now, um, with, with UMTS, everything is kind of complicated. So there's a, a different connections, of course, happening all at the same time, and then they get allocated to different channels. So now, in order to to decode this text message, we get to find out which channel is used. Um, so this command gives us the list of which, which channels have been allocated, and we got to find the TIMZ from earlier in one of these channel allocations. Um, and Wireshark is a great help in this. We didn't have to do anything with Wireshark. It just knows all that 3G stuff right out of the box. Um, so luckily, the first of these five connection requests is the right one, and scroll all the way down. There's then the parameters that say which channel this transaction happened on. So those two numbers, 15 and 48. Is the channel so we, we we need the cell frequency? But we need those those two two numbers that that, that is, are the channel and the key. You know, there's only 64 bit. I'll I'll discuss that a little later. Uh, and that's all we need to decrypt an SMS. And there it is. Thank you. This still works today, but only against two out of the four German networks. Um, some, some of them moved to, um, to, to stop some of these messages. Of course, most importantly, um, this SI message that gives you the decryption key. But even if you block this message, just acquiring somebody's location can already be uh, intrusive enough. Right? Um, all right. Moving on to 3G security, or rather extending on 3G security, since this already uh, touched 3D, 3G in a big way. Um, <clears throat> you remember the good old days where, where you could just intercept all phone calls with the Osmocom uh, phone? Thank you, by the way, for that open source project. That helped us so much over the years. And you combine that with uh, the Kraken software um, to decrypt uh, the phone call. So with 20 euro versus a phone and a server, you can listen to anybody's GSM calls, as long as they're using the A51 cipher. Um, some networks recently moved into A53, so it doesn't work this way anymore. Now, how does this now compare to 3G security? Um, as I've just shown, um, basically the same attacks are possible. Instead of the Osmocom phone, we use a programmable radio, some more software, but it's, again, very affordable, uh, 400 euros or something. Um, and you combine that using, instead of Kraken, SS7 queries. So unless we fix uh, SS7, 3G is no more secure than 2G. And neither is A53, the recent upgrade of GSM, uh, because those keys are again exposed over SS7. Um, now, some networks, uh, you don't even need that second part. So they have bigger things to worry about than, um, than SS7 attacks. And our 
data set isn't all that large. Some of you provided measurements through, through a software release last year. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and we have captures from maybe 20, 25 countries. Um, out of those, five happen to use no 3G encryption at all. Well, four countries, five network operators, right? um, which I find shocking. Some of these even have encryption turned on on their GSM network and they forgot to turn it on or deliberately left it out because it's harder to intercept on their 3G variant. Right? So those networks, as I said, have much more, much, much more worrisome issues than SS7 attacks. Um, and they really need to be called out. And we do that uh, with an extension of a website that we've been maintaining for a couple of years, GSM Map. Uh, big update of GSM Map launched today um, with all the 3G measurements we, uh, we collected and you collected um, over the last couple of years. Um, now, some of you may have used um, GSM Map before. The idea is to, to rank operators in, in the three categories. How hard is it to intercept phone calls and SMS? Is it easy to in impersonate a person and then put charges on their bill, for instance, or receive their calls? Uh, how hard is it to track them? And as you see over the last years, networks have improved their security, right? At least some, right? As always. Uh, God. Um, and as you also see, these are the 2G networks. Even the best secure 2G network in, uh, in Germany anyway, uh, in, in our uh, opinion, is less secure than the worst secured 3G networks. These are the four 3G networks. Still, we want networks to implement all security features. And as, as you saw before, some, some other countries don't have that luxury of all 3G secured. Uh, networks are reasonably secured. Um, now, the first version of our metric is very crude, and we want to improve uh, upon this over time. But currently, how we calculate this score is we'll give 90% of the points to anybody who switches on encryption. That's the main security feature. And the remaining 10% you earn by changing the TIMZ quickly. TIMZ is what we needed for these SS7 attacks to work well. So if you keep changing it, it really confuses the, uh, the, the person trying to, to haunt you. Um, also, this makes other types of attacks more difficult. We'll factor in a couple of more values as we uh, collect more data. Uh, but this is it for now. Uh, so yeah, big update on GSM map. If you haven't checked it out, um, check out your country on GSM map. Uh, read the country report. So there's a uh, six page or so um, report auto generated um, that that explains what types of measurements we included into into these graphs and why we think they they constitute certain risks. Um, maybe forward it to to your network and say if you're not improving, I'm going to change, uh, switch to another network. Um, now, not everything is on, on GSM map yet because we don't have enough data. Um, and there's one problem in particular that I want to start warning about uh, because I really think we're, we're running into an issue here. And that is the length of encryption key. You saw in the, in the capture, in the video that I, that I showed, that the, that the key that came back over SS7 was actually only 64-bit um, from this particular network. And uh, the SIM card that was, that was used in this attack, uh, was bought that very same week. So we recorded this video last week. So it's the, the, the most recent SIM card you can buy from this network. And still, it only uses 64-bit. And that, in my view, is incompatible with what we have learned from, from recent Snowden documents that the NSA, in 2011-2012, funded a project to break A53. This is a 64-bit cipher. And we had estimated at this very conference a year ago that you'd need about a million dollars to break A53. Now, they did it a little bit earlier, so Moore's Law, everything's more expensive, and probably they have overhead too, uh, but they spent apparently four billion pound. I don't know why pound, not dollars, but this may have been some GCHQ corporation. So, for four million pound, a couple of years ago, you could already break 64-bit crypto. And 64-bit is more prevalent in mobile networks than you would have thought. Um, when they upgraded the, the GSM networks um, to A53, they didn't actually upgrade it to UMTS security, as everybody claimed they did. They, they upgraded it to the cipher used in UMTS with a key half the size. 
when writing the A53 standard, though, um, the, the people were smart enough to also put in the real uh, UMTS cipher with full key size. They called it A54, and it has never been seen anywhere since. It's written in the standard. It r was released the same day that A53 was released. Nobody has ever moved to implement that. So GSM, for the time being, is and will be vulnerable to anybody with a $1 million machine in the basement, right? Certainly NSA, but more and more people as we move forward. And what costs a million dollars today, thanks to Moore's Law, in a couple of years, anybody can break it on their computers, like we today break the A51. If your network uses certain older SIM cards, differentiation here is between a SIM card and a USIM, as in UMTS SIM card. If your network only uses SIM cards, um, then even your 3G transactions are 64-bit encrypted. So there is no way to generate more entropy. You could query for two keys, I guess, but they weren't smart enough to do that. So 64-bit encryption uh, for UMTS. Uh, and that's just not good enough. And as I said, the network that we, that we did the demo with, uh, we were surprised to see a 64-bit key. We went back in our database of SIM cards. We found a lot of SIM cards that have this problem. We want to add this to GSM map, but we don't want to be unfair just because we see one very old SIM card in the network. We don't want to give them a low score versus somebody else where we only see a new card. So we need lots and lots of data. Um, help us collect those data and uh, we'll, we'll make it public. Now, that's one reason why we stay on this ball and, and progress the, the research. The other main reason, and this is really what, what keeps us awake at night, is this question of how can we get out of the mess? We've been producing more and more problems. Or should, I should not say produce. We, we uh, make you aware of more and more problems over the years. And we always criticize that at least many networks do not respond to those. So we have this stockpile, ever-growing stockpile of mobile security issues and nobody seems to be addressing. And all we do is wait for our networks to do something eventually. Now, waiting is over for me at least. I'm impatient. I want to do something now. And I want to address all these issues all at once. Those issues that we talked about for, for uh, several years now, including the SIM card attacks from last year, um, silent SMS-based tracking, the, SMS, uh, the, the SS7 abuse um, discussed today, um, IMSI catcher vulnerabilities, and insufficiently configured uh, networks, 2G as well as 3G. Um, all of these problems have one thing in common. Your phone technically knows that these attacks are happening. And your phone technically knows that the network is configured insecurely. But unfortunately, it's buried very deep inside the phone. It's buried inside the baseband. So as much as you can program Android, you don't get access to that information. At least so we saw it. And then we set out, and this took the better part of this year, uh, we wanted to dig the information out from these phones. It's somewhere in there. There must be some way to hack it out of it. And we found debug possibilities for Qualcomm chipsets. Just one vendor, but extremely popular right now. They seem to be in every LTE phone and in a bunch of other phones. And we found, uh, we found ways of producing exactly all the data um, on the right-hand side uh, to make it accessible through an Android application. And we also wrote the application for you. So, release today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, released today, Snoop Snitch under GPL, um, a tool that collects all this baseband information, uh, mostly to keep it on the phone and run some analysis on it, warn you about, um, as I said, SIM card attacks, but also those SS7 attacks that Tobias and I talked about today. How do you detect those, those attacks? Well, by the pagings. Uh, I showed you in the, in the video that every time we send certain queries to the phone, um, uh, to, to over SS7, that the phone actually also receives information. Useful for the attacker, also useful for the defender. If those empty pagings, we call them, are received by the phone, strong evidence that somebody is messing with you over SS7. Right? Um, so it collects all that information and it produces warnings. Um, you can also upload uh, information if you so choose. That's optional, of course. Um, it runs, as I said, on a, on a bunch of Android phones that are currently popular. It 
requires a somewhat recent Android version. We haven't tested it with Android 5 yet, but I don't see why it wouldn't work there. We just have to put the time in. Your phone needs to be rooted, so we have uh, read access to a certain interface that otherwise is not accessible. Um, and it needs, of course, a Qualcomm chipset, which, as you see by this list, is in uh, most current flagship phones. Um, it's on Google Play right now, so download it if you're uh, interested. Um, now, how does this tool work? One, one example only, of course, right? Read the source code if you, if you want to know the rest. Um, if you, for instance, IMSI catcher detection. Um, there have been a bunch of tools so far to do IMSI catcher uh, detection. Um, the one we released a couple of years ago was called Catcher Catcher, but it had two limitations, one practical, one more bound to experience. The practical limitation was that it ran on Osmocom phones. And Osmocom phones can't do most phone functionality, so it was your second phone, and it had to be connected to a computer, so very unlikely that you carried this around all the time. Now, we wanted to move it onto a real phone that you can use, onto your phone, right? I think we succeeded in that. The second limitation was that we really didn't know how IMSI catchers behaved, or we also didn't know how real networks behaved. And thanks to all the data on GSM map, we, we think we have a much better understanding now of all the weird corner cases, how real networks behave, and created a much better rule set uh, for, for uh, an Android-based catcher-catcher tool now. And the rules go in two categories. One is the configuration of, the, of these different cells. For instance, the lack of encryption when you know from the GSM app database that this network does usually support encryption. That's a big red flag. Also certain other configurations. So that's the configuration of the network. The other is the behavior. An IMSI catcher wants to get information out from you. At the very least, the IMSI, of course, it's in the name, right? Um, so there's suspicious behavior. Now, none of these things taken by themselves um, det allow you to detect an IMSI catcher. So we compute a score over these different events, uh, doing stream analysis on everything that happens on your phone, and eventually then uh, come out with a warning if, if the score crosses a certain threshold. Um, there's a bunch more we would have wanted to include that's even on a Qualcomm chipset in its debug mode not available. So this is still ongoing work as these chipsets progress and may give us more information in the future. Um, now, if you do find um, alerts, let's call them alarms, uh, on your phone, uh, we'd be grateful if you could share them. Now, as I said, this is optional, right? You get, oops, you get the alerts um, shown, in, uh, show, shown in your little tool, uh, and then you can choose to upload whichever ones you think should be shared. Um, if we get enough of them and, um, and, and think that there's really hot spots of, uh, of, of abuse, of course, we'll try to make that transparent. Perhaps even put little dots on the GSM map website so people know uh, where abuse could be happening around demonstrations, around embassies, wherever, right? Thank you. <laughs> Um, you can also actively choose to submit data by, by running an active test. Uh, now, usually the phone looks at everything that you produce, your phone calls, your SMS. That's always stored on the phone. There's no way to upload that. And you compute a, a score um, for how secure ne your network is you using the exact same metrics that we use on GSM map. So that's all ported to the phone now. But if you feel like the, the score on GSM map is heavily outdated, click this button. It runs some benign tests. has nothing to do with your transactions, I guess your location, where you're currently connected would be included in the data, and it uploads it to GSM map. So that becomes better and better, and we can, um, t we can spot more networks that, for instance, lack any encryption at all. Um, yeah, so what's, what, what, what are you, uh, what would I like you to do, or I think you should do, to better protect yourself from mobile abuse? Of course, you could, uh, keep waiting for your mobile network to fix all these issues, which I must say, more recently, more networks have moved to fix issues, but still not the majority. And no network has even started to address the majority of issues, right? So it's, it's just stretching the surface. So what I'd rather have you do is start defending yourself. Check out GSM map, see if you are on a network that generally protects things like encryption. You saw the networks that lack encryption. Um, 
don't use those. And um, if you really choose to self-defend, uh, download Snoop Snitch, this new tool, um, and actively look out for abuse, for uh, silent SMS, binary SMS that you receive, for empty pagings, for IMSI catcher evidence, uh, and help us grow this database of abuse, right? Um, also help us grow the, the tool uh, base that we use. Uh, this is released open source, and we put in a lot of work to make the data accessible. But now it is accessible, right? Just take it as a library and go wild with it. Do whatever you always wanted to do with raw basement data on 2G, 3G, 4G. I'm very much looking forward to your contributions to this. And all that's left for me to say is thank you very much. Thank you, Carsten. Then we will begin with the Q&A. Please, oh. for everybody that will be ask questions, please line up on the microphones in the room. And for people that exit the room, please do it with no, uh, no noise and uh, quickly. Now, uh, b before getting into the question, let me give you one reason to actually do leave now. There's a workshop happening right now, or in a few minutes, that will explain how this tool uh, works and what it can all do. We'll have an IMSI catcher there, so you can test how that feels like being connected to, to an IMSI catcher. It's happening in room C, which is when you exit here, one floor down and to this end. And uh, for, uh, as additional information, the workshops <laughs> that Carsten says starts at 19.45. And now to your questions. Sure. Yeah. Okay, the microphone number two. And please, before before we uh, before you can start number two, please do it with no <laughs> noise, that we hear the question from uh, from the audience. Okay, you, number two, please. Thank you. Can you um, quickly say say a few words about why it wouldn't work on custom ROMs? Because we could just install it onto Cyanogen phones, and it, it apparently installed, and it seems to work. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the way I understood custom ROMs is that they first remove a bunch of stuff from the phone, and then they put a bunch of stuff on it. Part of what we need are these proprietary Qualcomm libraries, and at least on the phones where we tried Sunagon Mod, they are being removed. Right? So if Sunagon Mod could stop doing that, it would work beautifully. It's not that we need anything additionally, we just need less to be deleted. Okay, thank you. Okay, then. <laughs> Microphone uh, number, will you ask? Okay. Are there some questions from the IRC? I think we have a bunch uh, of questions. Actually, there is five questions, so I will just ask one or two for yes. starting. That's perfectly. Um, the first one is, uh, can all the shown attacks that you Proved uh, on your speech be mitigated by, uh, by higher protocols levels like encrypted VYP or text secure things like that. And what would be the residual risks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So, how much can you protect yourself by using the the mobile network less or using it as a dumb pipe? I guess is the question. What if you use just apps to call and, and send texts? Well, obviously your calls and your texts won't be intercepted anymore uh, if they are encrypted one more time in a way that's not breakable. Um, however, this does not solve the location tracking. It does not solve the fraud. It does not solve the denial of service. It does not solve the spamming. So you are tied to a mobile network, and it has a lot of control over you, your location, and your phone bill. None of that is going to go away. Another question from the ISC. One? Yeah. Um, the second one is, wouldn't it be easier to um, design from scratch a new mobile, mobile network than trying to find all flows from actual networks, which is an endless task? 
uh, I don't know where you would even start designing everything from scratch completely. Um, the closest that I can think of designing mobile networks from scratch is LTE. It's in the name, long-term evolution. It really wants to change everything, but gives it a couple of years. But as Tobias pointed out, those issues we pointed out today, they are again included in LTE. Diameter is the interconnect uh, protocol. So we already missed the chance to, to remove much of these issues by just upgrade. We'll have to fix it through firewalling and monitoring, like we never got to update the internet. Okay, microphone number four, please. Um, yeah, just short thing. Um, could you just provide a list of those libraries you need from the um, stock uh, um, images? So sure. I think it's pretty easy to copy them to the Cyanogen mod images. Okay. And uh, if the app is open source, maybe you can put it uh, on f read. Oh, absolutely, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> the microphone number two, please. Uh, got two questions. Uh, if I understood correctly, you need to be inside the operator network to actually perform those SS7 queries, right? Um, well, uh, I, would, I would like for this to be the case, but currently just anybody in the world connected to SS7 can send these queries. Okay, right? so my question is that how, what was your hook point for actually doing this test? I think I'll quote Tobias here by saying I'd rather not say anything about that. Okay. So the second question is about the KC you mentioned. Uh, it's, if I am not mistaken, it's the session key, right? It's, uh, and it should involve that nonce value, right? Uh -huh. that, uh, yeah. So if it is, uh, it already has the nonce value, so in order the attack to work, we also need to intercept the initial uh, messages, the nonce uh, exchange between the uh, target and the base station, is that uh, correct? No, the, the nonce is, is there, so the, the SIM card knows which key to produce. Yes, but... So uh, it's, it helps the, the, the phone to find the right encryption key. We are not the phone, we don't have the SIM card. Right. If so, you just give us the encryption key, we don't need the nonce. Yes, so... What uh, you're saying is that the query you're sending there, it actually uh, sends you not only the encryption key, but also the nonce that is required. It doesn't send us the nonce, and we don't need the nonce. We can take that offline. I'll explain okay. how everything okay. works. Thank you. The microphone number three, please. <clears throat> um, yeah, first of all, thank you for a very good presentation and the very impressive work you've done here. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Um, the question I have might be a little naive, but um, have you also, besides taking a look at this closing, this whole issue technically wise, also been taking a look into how, um, what measures can be taken legally, at least in Germany and some countries in Europe, uh, now that we have disclosed that basically um, certain law, rules, law sets or rules have not been fulfilled, that we can enforce uh, the operators to implement this stuff on legal ways? Um, we have not looked into it. Of course, we consider the possibility as soon as somebody has an overview of where these attacks happen. And that seems to be the issue right now. There's zero attack transparency. Nobody is looking for these issues. And partly, that's to their, to their own uh, disbenefit, because it, as soon as they do look for these issues, some of these attack patterns are very easy to stop. As I said, two German networks mitigated them within two weeks, and these issues had been open for 20 years. Had they ever looked into their own data, they would have seen this going on. Um, so I'm, I'm not very confident that anybody, in Germany at least, has an overview of where abuse would come from. And as soon as it uh, does, I don't think there's mu much point in litigating. Let's just stop the possibility of abuse, right? Instead of complaining about it happening, right? But I'm with you. If, if there's corner cases in which abuse just can't be stopped, let's fight it legally, of, of course, right? And if all of you contribute information, snoo snoop stitch, this, the, the empty pagings. If we can find patterns of abuse, of course we'll, we'll aggregate them and, and try to move against them. Thank you. Okay, okay microphone number four, please. Uh, you said you're, uh, you can buy your way into the SS7 network. 
but uh, how easy is it actually to get your uh, access? And what do you estimate? How many players are there in the network? Can you give any estimation? I, I have absolutely no idea. I know that there's some 800 companies who, ha who, who are uh, legally allowed to access SS7, and then those, of course, have subcontractors, legal and illegal, and some people who bribe them, yet other people who hack their systems or the systems of their subcontractors. It's very hard to estimate, no idea. But definitely too many to trust all of them. And would it be possible for me uh, to get access to this without any uh, opera uh, operator um, uh, stuff? Or I don't want to operate a phone network, but I want to have, to ac uh, have access because I want to provide a service, some service. Well, I wish the answer was no, but of course, right, if Tobias and I and a bunch of other people can get access, you should be able to get that too. But I'm not going to tell you how. <laughs> Yet another question from the IRC. Um, we're about nine questions, so no problem for me. Um, first one, what about uh, Windows phones, jailbreaked iPhones or things like this? Will the app fin uh, end on these phones? Uh, our app doesn't run on anything other than Android, but the, um, the chipsets are of course the same. So if you can speak to a chipset um, through a jailbroken iPhone, for instance, you could create a similar application. We just wanted to target the, the, the biggest population of phones, and that seems to be Android phones. Then number two, please. Yeah, one um, further thought on self-defense. As um, self-defense has, don't have to be proportionate, I think, and um, identities um, are not secure in the digital sphere. Um, how about developing some um, proactive, as we heard the word, uh, defense tools? Proactive as in hack the networks until they have no chance but to fix? <laughs> That's what you understood, but well, um, I support that. I'm, I'm not going to say that I dislike the idea, but you won't see me here next year explaining how I did it. <laughs> Thank you. Microphone number three, please. Okay, um, when did you check the other two German networks uh, didn't fix the send identifier uh, issue. Um, Which network do you work for? Uh, I'm, I'm Holger, we talked last week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, maybe you fixed it too. We didn't, we yeah, didn't check. We, we fixed it, uh, it was in 24, uh, 24 hours after our call. Oh wow. Okay. On, on both networks. Thank you. <laughs> Better late than never. Yeah. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, so it's three out of four now that fixed. One out of hundred problems. No, it's yeah. I, I know that that's why we don't go to the press and yeah. don't tell uh, that uh, SS7 is fixed. And we, have, uh, we we know we still have problems. Also, it's uh, all four. I not uh, I um, um, uh, work for Telefonica, which is O2 and A+. Plus. Oh yeah. Well, congratulations. <laughs> sorry, sorry for spoiling your Christmas. <laughs> Microphone number two, please. <laughs> I'd like to know why these empty pagings occur in the context of the location tracking. I thought <laughs> as soon as the phone registers in the network, then the, the um, base station which mm -hmm. is connected to is known in the network anyway. Isn't that the case? That's a very good question. And let me, let me go back to, to one earlier slide to, to explain that. Uh, one second. Um, so the, the empty pagings do not occur when you send these creepy anytime interrogation messages. Okay. They are just there for spying and there's no way to page the customer. But since this get, got blocked and Tobias went into great level of detail explaining this, you need a couple of other messages to now track somebody's location. And these messages weren't meant for location tracking, they're meant for other purposes. For instance, this PSI provides subscriber info um, that however you reach it is always the last message you need. This does do a paging. And then the provide subscriber info really makes no sense unless you send something afterwards also deliver an SMS, connect a call, whatever. So the paging is already sent in anticipation that an SMS will come or that a call will come. But if you're only the creepy guy tracking, you're not gonna send that SMS and that's where the empty paging comes from. 
Okay, but still, also in these cases where something follows the paging, isn't it a type of double checking whether it's really there? Or, I mean, the the location uh, info itself should already be present in the network, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just reconfirms that the subscriber okay. is really there. So it's basically saying. Somebody just interrogated your location because they want to send you something. Let's check that you're really still there, okay. because otherwise we'll tell them something wrong. But Tobias, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, uh, okay, so um, the empty paging is not in anticipation of something that's uh, coming after, it's to get the uh, current cell that you are located at. Because um, when you are moving around in your location area, in the area uh, that is covered by the switching center that you are currently being served by, uh, your phone doesn't necessarily um, contact the base station. So. Um, It could be that uh, that the network's last position uh, of you is uh, somewhere you received an SMS or text uh, uh, or call, and then you moved to a completely different area. And if your phone didn't have network contact in the meantime, um, the network would still only know the last point of contact. Mm -hmm. So that's why the uh, why the empty paging happens, so that the um, that the network knows the base station that's actually currently. Uh, closest to you. That's also the um, uh, why the uh, why law enforcement uses a lot of silent SMS so that they that they can get the last position uh, in in the network. And it's also an option. If you send uh, provide subscriber information, you can just send it and get back uh, the last known position uh, without a paging. Mm -hmm. Or you can set the current location flag in provide subscriber information, and only then the subscriber gets paged, and uh, you will receive the uh, the current. Uh, location. And that's, so, that's one good example for how um, SS7, which is supposed to be so insecure, we can never fix it, can easily be fixed. There's an option that says we're using this, this normal feature that's absolutely needed, and we have this creepy extension to also ask for the location, and some networks choose to not answer that. They answer with 0000, zero, zero, zero and nothing broke. Right? So you can just ignore the insecure parts of SS7 and do whatever you think is right. And for the most part, it, it continues to work. But I, I think we're, we're well beyond answering your question now, right? No, but um, from your answers, thank you very much. Uh, um, but uh, um, another question <laughs> arises because if it's actually to, to locate uh, your phone and to find out which cell you're actually in, then it implies that it's not only one base station that sends the paging call, but a whole bunch of uh, base stations. Uh, do you know something about the algorithm? I mean, how, how many around the last known location are, are paging my well, phone? Everybody or is can it nationwide, or how does it Everybody work? can implement this as, as they wish, and uh, I don't have much insights into th how 3G <coughs> does it, but in 2G, typically, is there's one paging send in the last cell that saw you. You don't respond, it's sent in a larger area. You okay. don't respond, it's sent for the whole location area. And in some networks, you don't respond, they send it in the entire country, right? Okay. But that's rare. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, questions from the IRC. Um, did uh, Snoop Snitch allow you to um, reveal any kind of attack uh, in countries? not special name in mind. Does it allow you to detect attacks in countries? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some kind of tabs or I think the, the answer is yes. Its whole purpose is to, to detect attacks and it also works in countries. But <laughs> did you succeed in detecting attacks? Did we succeed in detecting yeah. attacks? Yes, we did. And if you go down to the Saal C, uh, room C, um, you can see how it's currently people are being attacked and currently they detect that. Okay. Okay, microphone number five, please. Yes, uh, thanks. Going back to SS7 basics, can you quickly explain how SS7 is implemented? Is this a VPN on the public internet through the providers? <coughs> What's the technical reality, the transport? Yeah, that's what's a very good surface, question. Of course. That's a very good question. And um, so I, I only have half of the information, too. I, I keep learning. But so it, it seems that it, it was implemented initially as a network between Western European telcos and they ran cables, dedicated cables for SS7. Zigtron, they called this. Right? And 
then a couple more networks connected to it, and each of them had to run a cable to one of the other telcos. But eventually they changed that and they introduced what they call routing providers. So telcos are not connected to each other usually, but through a routing provider, like on the internet. And those routing providers, they typically don't run a cable to your house anymore if, if you're a new telco. They give you a VPN over the internet. Right? So it's diverse. I'm sure there's still some dedicated lines between Germany and France, say, and there's some others connecting in these big clouds that are routing providers. And it's actually really difficult to get your address routed everywhere in the world. So even if you connect to SS7, all you're connected to is one routing provider, and that routing provider knows that you own these addresses. Now it's up to you to convince every other of the big seven or nine, depending on how you count, routing providers that you are that guy with those addresses. So the BGP equivalent of, of SS7 is to get nine roaming agreements signed with people on these other nine uh, operators and then fax those roaming agreements to everybody else involved so they type it into, your com into their computers, right? Very manual and very hard to grow the network, but for the most part it doesn't change, of course. So the, the low-level transport is not really an attack surface from the public internet? It can be. The low-level transport can be an attack surface if people just stupidly leave open their, their, their local networks, um, but it's rare. It's much more common, speaking about our talk next year hopefully, um, on the other interconnect networks. There's one interconnect network for, for data roaming, it's called GRX, and since everything is IP anyway on data roaming. Uh, people sometimes do leave it out on the internet or just do it unencrypted over the internet. And it does seem to become more popular also with the SS7 replacement diameter, which again is pure IP. So there's no de dedicated thing that you first have to encapsulate in a VPN before you can route it over the internet. You can run diameter over the open internet if you want. It's stupid, but people seem to do it anyway. Okay, the microphone number six, please. Uh, okay, uh, my question is, um, if you could comment why these uh, messages were put in the protocol at the first place, if they are so easy to block and to fix. And the other question is, if all the other uh, problems that you pointed out are as easy to fix for the network mm -hmm. operators. So I, d I don't have an answer to your qu first question. Why do you put a tracking message in the standard and then call it anytime interrogation? <laughs> Gosh, like that, that invokes feelings for me, interrogation room and all. I mean, this is spy stuff, right? And there's no practical purpose for it. But right, who wrote the SS7 standard? Western European governments being afraid of the Russians or of their own citizens, who knows, right? I don't know why they put every single message in though. Um, so your, your second question was what again? Um, if the other vulnerabilities are oh, as easy yeah. as to fix, uh, no, they're like not. just and blocking messages. No, they're not, and I tried to point that out in one of the slides, um, that, for, that, that any time interrogation can be fixed, as can, um, for instance, this send identification message, right? You just block that, there's no purpose routing this internationally. But the other queries on this page at least, you need those internationally, at least to enable roaming. Um, so the best you can do is, as I said, first block these queries from anybody who's not your roaming partner, right? Don't respond to those people, and then do some plausibility checking, secondly, right? Make sure that if a subscriber is actually in your own network, that you don't honor requests from another country, right? And that should remove most of the issues because most abuse comes from other countries. It's just more likely if there's 800 parties connected to this network that the one doing the abuse is not yours. Right? Good question, thank Thanks. you.